It is August 12, 2000, the Barents Sea, just off the northern coast of Russia. Hundreds of feet below the surface, the Russian nuclear submarine K-141 Kursk moves quietly through the cold, dark waters. A steel giant, nearly 500 feet long, armed with warheads, torpedoes, and loaded with enough firepower to level a city. On board, 118 sailors go about their routine. It's just another day aboard the pride of the Russian Northern Fleet. But deep in the torpedo room, something isn't right. A thin trail of liquid seeps from the highly volatile hydrogen peroxide is leaking from one of the massive Type 65 torpedoes. It drips, unnoticed, hissing softly as it eats through metal. 11.28 a.m. Suddenly, the first explosion. A blast rocks the forward torpedo compartment. The shockwave is immense. It tears through the front of the vessel, instantly killing most of the crew in the first two compartments. Automatic emergency systems activate, but it's too late. Two minutes and 15 seconds later, 11.30 a.m. A second, far more powerful explosion follows. Equivalent to nearly three tons of TNT, it rips through the submarine's hull. Bulkheads collapse, compartments flood. The Kursk loses all power and begins its slow descent to the ocean floor. Out of 118 men, 23 survive the blast, trapped in the rear of the submarine, waiting. And in that silence, one man begins to write. A note never meant to be read. And yet, it echoes across the world. The Kursk, officially known as K-141, is an Oscar II-class nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine, a true symbol of Russian naval strength. Commissioned in 1994, Kursk stands among the largest and most lethal submarines ever built. Measuring nearly 154 meters in length and weighing over 24,000 tons, it is roughly the size of two Boeing 747s placed end to end. Only a handful of submarines are larger. Russia's Typhoon class, the largest ever constructed at around 175 meters, and America's Ohio class, which stretches to about 170 meters. It carries 24 P-700 granite cruise missiles and powerful 6576 kit torpedoes, all backed by two nuclear reactors. It isn't just a war machine. It is built to survive a nuclear confrontation. The submarine was divided into nine compartments, each with a specific task. Torpedoes and weapon systems at the front, followed by control rooms, crew quarters, equipment and reactors in the middle, and finally, an emergency escape module at the rear. This layout was designed for efficiency and survival, but even the most advanced structure can't always withstand catastrophe. In August 2000, Kursk was chosen to lead Russia's largest naval exercise in over a decade. President Vladimir Putin, just months into office, wanted to project strength, both to the West and at home. 30 ships, three submarines, and thousands of sailors were deployed to the Barents Sea. For Kursk, this was routine. She'd done this before. On board Kursk are 118 men, some of the best trained sailors the Russian Navy has to offer. The crew is young, most are between 19 and 30 years old, with only a handful of senior officers over 40. Officers, engineers, sonar operators, weapon specialists, electricians, each has a role and each is part of the machine that makes Kursk more than just metal and reactors. Leading them is Captain Gennady Lyashin, an experienced submariner who spends more years beneath the ocean than most spend on land. In the ninth compartment, Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov oversees the ship's operations, the critical systems for damage control and survival. His role is essential especially in emergencies, making him one of the most trusted officers among the crew. Deep inside Kursk's forward compartment, beneath layers of steel, sits one of the most feared weapons in the Russian arsenal, the Type 65-76 kit torpedo. Over 11 meters long, fueled by high-test concentrated hydrogen peroxide, HTP, 
a volatile liquid that, when exposed to metal or impurities, violently decomposes. Western navies abandoned this type of fuel decades earlier due to safety concerns. Yet Russia, due to economic constraints and lack of alternatives, continues its use. Somewhere below the icy surface of the Barents Sea, the Kursk is in position to fire a dummy torpedo as part of the exercise. Suddenly, back-to-back -back explosions tear through the submarine. Out of 118 crew, 95 are killed instantly. Back at Naval Command, faint seismic readings register the Kursk's explosion, but no alarms are raised. The submarine fails to report in. It's scheduled check-in at 13.30 on August 12, 2000, coming and going without a word. Delays during exercises aren't uncommon, so commanders dismiss it as a minor issue. It wasn't until evening that concern began to grow. Admiral Popov, commander of the Northern Fleet, orders a helicopter from the Potter Veliki ship to search for the submarine. Inside, a handful of sailors sit in near darkness, staring at the escape hatch, their only way out. They face a daunting decision, one that could mean life or death. They could open the escape hatch now and swim the 100 meters to the surface using their rescue hoods. Right now, the pressure inside is close to normal. If they move fast, they can avoid decompression sickness. But it's not that simple. The moment they turn that wheel, freezing seawater could rush in flooding the ninth compartment completely. If the injured among them even make it out, they'll face the brutal waters of the Barents Sea, near freezing, deadly. At best, they might survive an hour on the surface, drifting in the icy Barents Sea, hoping to be found in time. Or they can stay put. The nuclear reactors are shut down. This means no power for heating or for cleaning the air. The temperature is falling and carbon dioxide is building up. They do have emergency breathing equipment that helps clean the air. The cartridges use a chemical, potassium superoxide, which removes carbon dioxide and releases fresh oxygen. But these cartridges are limited, and they won't last forever. Late on Saturday night, 12 hours after it sinks, Popov informs the Kremlin. But Defense Minister Igor Sergeyev doesn't notify President Vladimir Putin until 7 o'clock on Sunday morning. Sergeyev does not recommend that Putin visit the disaster site. It takes the Russian Navy more than 16 hours to locate the submarine, resting 108 meters below the surface. What follows is a string of unsuccessful rescue attempts, hampered by outdated equipment and poor coordination. On Sunday morning, nearly a full day after the submarine sinks, search crews aboard nearby ships finally detect something on the ocean floor. Hopes surge when they believe they hear tapping, an SOS signal from survivors, but it turns out to be a false alarm, possibly an anchor or even marine life. The Russian Navy begins its rescue efforts using two PRIS-class deep submergence rescue vehicles, DSRVs. The first submersible, AS-34 deploys early, but accidentally collides with the Kursk's hull in the murky, low-visibility waters of the Barents Sea. The impact damages its structure, forcing it to surface before making any meaningful contact. Shortly after, the second DSRV, AS-32, is launched, but a navigation error sends it in the wrong direction, costing several crucial hours before it's finally redirected to the wreck. As conditions worsen, the Navy lowers rescue bells, rigid diving chambers meant to latch onto submarine escape hatches, and deploys remotely operated vehicles, ROVs, with mechanical arms and cameras. But technical failures, strong underwater currents, and near-zero visibility make precise maneuvering almost impossible. Early on Sunday morning, 13th August, at the Vidya Avo Naval Base, rumors begin to circulate among family members of Kursk's crew that something is wrong. A telephone operator handles an unusual volume of calls and overhears that a submarine is in trouble and the boat's name. As the base is very small, news spreads quickly. Wives and family members exchange updates, but information remains scarce. Because Kursk is regarded as unsinkable, family members try to dismiss the worst of the rumors. 
They hope that Kursk is merely experiencing a temporary communication problem. The deputy base commander assures the women that the headquarters office is half empty and that the officers present are just passing the time. It is not until Thursday, five days after the sinking, that President Putin finally accepts international assistance. By then, critical time is already lost. On the 18th of August, six British and Norwegian dive teams arrive. The next day, the ship Norman Pioneer brings the British LR-5 rescue submarine. All new ones, those pressures have been equalized. Can you open the hatches safely and then let people transfer from the distress submarine into the rescue ship? Russian officials tell the divers they can only work at the back of the submarine, near the escape hatch and an air valve above the ninth compartment. The Norwegian divers disagree with these limits, believing they slow down the rescue. Eventually, the divers manage to gain access. Norwegian teams cut a hole in the submarine, and Russian divers go inside through the eighth compartment to reach the rear of the vessel. By August 21st, the truth can no longer be withheld. Norwegian divers, having finally reached the Kursk's wreck, confirm the worst fears. No one in the ninth compartment has survived. The Russian public is formally told what they have already begun to suspect. 118 sailors are gone. On August 22nd, President Putin declares a national day of mourning. Four days later, he posthumously awards the title of Hero of Russia to the Kursk's captain, Gennady Lyachin. The rest of the crew received the Order of Courage. But grief quickly turns into suspicion. In the days after the sinking, high-ranking naval officials begin floating a theory. The Kursk has collided with a foreign submarine, most likely from NATO. No proof is provided, but the narrative takes root and is repeated for years by senior Russian officers. The claim, politically convenient during a time of strained East-West relations, fuels nationalist sentiment. Russian sources name three specific vessels allegedly present the USS Memphis, USS Toledo, and HMS Splendid. Despite the speculation, American and British officials firmly deny any involvement. Then US Secretary of Defense William Cohen dismisses the theory publicly, asserting that no US submarine had been in contact with the Kursk, and that seismic data points instead to internal explosions. Meanwhile, outrage builds, not just over what happened, but how it was handled. As the Kursk's crew remain trapped beneath the sea and rescue attempts flounder, families wait in anguish, receiving little information and no clear answers from authorities. Public trust in the government collapses. When President Putin finally visits the naval base at Vidyayevo, the damage is already done. There, surrounded by hundreds of grieving relatives, he faces a storm of anger and sorrow. For hours he listens as people demand answers. The Russian government launches a $65 million mission to recover the Kursk and its crew, contracting Dutch firms Smit International and Mammoth, it becomes the largest and most complex submarine salvage operation ever attempted. To avoid the risk from unexploded torpedoes, divers first cut off the bow using a special underwater saw, a process that takes 10 days. Several fragments, including a torpedo tube and sonar dome, are recovered for analysis. The main hull is lifted using a heavily modified barge, Giant 4, equipped with 26 hydraulic jacks and over 200 kilometers of cable. Divers cut matching holes in both the barge and the submarine to insert hoisting cables. After 15 hours of careful lifting, Kursk is brought to the surface on 8th of October 2001. After recovering the bodies from the wreck, investigators find two handwritten notes on Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov, a senior officer from the turbine unit. The first note, written at 13.15, less than two hours after the second blast, reads, It's 13.15. All personnel from Section 6, 7 and 8 have moved to Section 9. 23 people are here. 
We feel bad, weakened by carbon dioxide, pressure is increasing in the compartment. If we head for the surface, we won't survive the compression. We won't last more than a day. All personnel from sections 6, 7 and 8 have moved to section 9. We have made the decision because none of us can escape. At 1515, Kolesnikov manages a second note, the handwriting faltering under worsening conditions. It's dark here to write, but I'll try by feel. It seems like there are no chances, 10 to 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Here's the list of personnel from the other sections who are now in the ninth and will attempt to get out. Regards to everybody, no need to despair. Kolesnikov. The official investigation into the Kursk disaster culminates in a 133-volume, top-secret report compiled by the Russian government and Prosecutor General Vladimir Ustinov, released in August 2002, nearly two years after the sinking. Only a four-page summary is published in the state newspaper. It reveals widespread negligence, outdated equipment, protocol breaches and a critically delayed rescue effort. The report concludes that the disaster began when hydrogen peroxide leaked from a faulty 6576 kit practice torpedo, triggering the first explosion. Despite internal concerns, the volatile HTP torpedoes had been approved by officers who lacked proper authority, and the dummy torpedo used during the exercise was a decade old. Its components well past their service life. Reportedly, one of the torpedoes may have been damaged after being dropped during transport, but was still loaded onto the submarine. Crew members had noticed fuel leaks from the torpedo's rubber seals the day before the exercise and reported them, but their warnings were dismissed in the rush to proceed with the mission. After the Kursk disaster, President Putin quietly begins replacing top military leaders. Defense Minister Igor Sergeyev steps down in March 2001 and is replaced by Sergei Ivanov, the first civilian to hold the position, which makes many in the military uneasy. Putin also removes key naval officials, including Fleet Commander Vyacheslav Popov and Admiral Mikhail Motsak, who strongly support the false theory that a NATO submarine causes the accident. Deputy Prime Minister Ilya Klebanov who oversees the failed rescue and investigation, is also reassigned. In total, 12 senior officers are dismissed. Putin says it isn't because of the disaster itself, but because of organizational flaws. Most of them quietly move into other government or civilian jobs. In the years after the disaster, Russia takes quiet but meaningful steps toward change. In 2011, for the first time ever, a Russian submarine joins a NATO-led search and rescue drill. Something unthinkable just a decade NATO earlier. Exercise Bold Monarch is an exercise that brings together all of the world's systems of submarine rescue into one coordinated exercise. The Navy also begins training more deep-sea divers each year, doubling the number from around 20 to over 40, hoping to avoid another tragedy like the Kursk. Near Severodvinsk, where the submarine is built, a granite memorial now stands in the windswept dunes beside the sea. Carved into it are the words, This sorrowful stone is set in memory of the crew of the nuclear submarine Kursk, who tragically die on the 12th of August 2000 while on military duty. Far away, in the city of Kursk, pieces of the sub's torn hull are turned into a monument, a silent, rusting tribute to the men who never come home.